Today's topic is utilization rates. You went out to lunch, laughed at each other's jokes, got a tour of the office, everybody seems so nice. Now you start the job. After your first week or maybe your first month, your supervisor sits you down and explains to you in filling out your timesheet what a utilization rate is. And what that means is you're going to be working a lot of hours and you won't always be paid for those hours. Welcome aboard. You soon realize you're not there for personal development, professional mentoring, or company team building. You're there to create billable hours. These billable hours are the primary driving factor within this company. As a technician, you don't create these budgets, but you live and die by these budgets. And in order to earn trust within this system, you make agreements. And these agreements often include working hours in which you're not paid. Utilization rates in and of themselves aren't bad. Actually, they're an excellent planning tool that are necessary in a business. For example, if you have X amount of employees and they're billable at a certain rate for a certain amount of time, it helps you allocate your overhead. It also helps you plan ahead. It tells you if you're understaffed, if you're overstaffed. It tells you if you need more work. These are all good things and necessary things in planning. Where it becomes a problem or where it becomes a burden is when the utilization rates are unrealistic and the employees are held to them so strictly that we see some ethical slips and certainly some work product slips. When employees are held to these utilization rates that aren't always realistic, then that's when you start to see the fissures in the system. I'm going to go through these systems today and we're going to talk about the downside of strict utilization rates and more importantly how they don't fit a land surveyor's work. First I'm going to explain what a utilization rate is. If you work 40 hours in a work week and 20 of those hours are billable to a client or to a project that's a 50% utilization rate. A 40 hour work week is 2,080 hours in a year. When you account for vacation time, holidays, paid sick leave, you end up with about 1920 hours in a year. The utilization rate is often factored at the 2080. So what this means is, is that if you're billable 40 hours a week, every day you're in the office, you have a 92% utilization rate. That's the max. When a company determines what your utilization rate is for your position, say 85%, that means that 85% of your time is billable to a project. Well, you have a maximum of 92%. So that gives you a 7% delta or less than two hours a week that you're not billable. You have staff meetings, you take phone calls, you have discussions with your coworkers. These are discussions that are related to the business of that company. You're required to run errands. You're required to help with projects that don't have billing numbers. Those two hours a week are eat, eaten up very quickly, and this isn't what you dreamed of looking over the shoulder of your boss, being guided down a professional track. As an employee, and to pick a round number like $50, the employee cost is about one and a half times the hourly wage. So an employee that makes $50 an hour, the cost of that employee is about $75 an hour. Of course, that does not account for the building, overhead, and equipment, and things of this nature. To figure out the cost of an employee, they factor in overhead and profit. Generally, it's factored in at 20%, even though most firms don't realize that. So a, multi a, a true multiplier generally will range from 2.6 to 3.0. So a $50 employee multiplied times three is $150. So that employee's billing rate should be $150 85% of the time. That's how the company model is set up. If you have 10 employees and you add an 11th person, that person's cost is $75 an hour. The, the space allocation and the overhead barely ticks up. Do they reevaluate the utilization rates? Maybe give you a little more free time? Maybe give you a little more training? Not usually. Those utilization rates are including the membership at the country club, the S-Class series out in the parking garage, and those nice vacations that you'll never take. I've explained utilization rates and multipliers. Now let's talk about contracts and how businesses get their work. 
A lot of times if you're in a big engineering surveying house, the engineers actually own the company and run the company. So in order to get work and to secure the engineering work, they short sell the land surveying work. What that means is, is they don't budget enough hours to do their job properly. And that's where we see a lot of illegal surveying going on. Two monument tangles, unfiled records of survey. These contracts come in as time and materials not to exceed. They get loaded up at the beginning. Everybody's happy to be working and they're putting the hours in. If you're, if you're a project manager, you're running a tight ship. You're maybe getting a few free hours from your employees, but then one of the partners come in, snatch up a handful of hours at a very high rate and you're upside down. Well, the work's not done. What do you do? First thing you do is you lean on your, your, your hour, your salary employees and you tell them, that they need to be loyal to the company. This is what we had to do. I got your buy-in at the beginning. And that means you need to be here on the weekend or in the evenings working because you working a, a, a tremendous amount of hours actually doesn't cost the company any more money. The next alternative is to get the hourly employee that's on the bottom of the chain because their time and a half is considerably less than maybe, maybe the regular salary of one of the, one of the other employees. That's why you find land surveyors that are working 60, 70 hours a week is, and that's the reason is the work needs to get done and the money's gone. And they also have to fit into this 85% utilization rate. The other type of contract is a fixed fee contract, which means that you get paid the same regardless of how many hours you put into the project. These contracts are hard to price in many instances. The reason is, is land surveyors deal with a tremendous amount of variables in their work. We don't know which pipe we're going to find or which property monuments we're going to find. We don't know how big this survey has to get. We also don't know what the records are going to show us, even if we've done a lot of research. They can go upside down relatively quickly. What they like to do is they like to get the people to work on these jobs and come in under budget, which means less than the hours budgeted because that 20% profit that's built into those hourly rates you can exceed the profit. And the only chance you have to exceed the profit is on a fixed fee job and to do it for less than the hours budgeted. So there's a lot of incentive there to manipulate the employees. Here's something to think about. What if your billable hourly rate exceeds a 3-0 multiplier? Let's use $30 an hour. Your, your multiplier would put you at $90 an hour billable. If the company is billing you at 150, why aren't they relaxing your utilization rate a little bit and take the opportunity to mentor you? That seldom happens. They usually maintain that rate. That means that that 20% profit is driving that, that company more than your personal development. That's just a fact. It's in the numbers. If you're a salaried employee, how is it that you work 60 hours a week and yet your timesheet only shows 40 or only shows the billable hours over 40? This is another peculiar instance. Last thing to think about is this, is why are you as a rank and file employee shouldering the financial exposure or liability of a company? You're not the one driving an S class, taking care of the horses on the weekend, taking extravagant, extravagant vacations and yet you're the one who bears the burden of a loss in that company because they don't have a loss. They won't have a loss and the reason being is they hold you to these rates and is that what you signed up for? Or if a project rolls upside down, which means you don't have any budget left and there's work to be done, have you ever seen one of these partners or one of these project managers cough up their hours from a previous timesheet and give them to you so that you can work and get paid? These are all things to, to think about and to look at. Each company is a little different. However, this isn't in the employee handbook. Here's how it works in play. The engineer sets the budget to secure the engineering work. The land surveyors are going to be the first ones in. Either an ALTA or an OTOPO is, is how, the, how they get their foot in the door to secure the engineering work. What do they do to get that engineering work? They cut the budget on the land surveying. They'll ask you for a budget, and so you figure out the cost to do a proper boundary, to do the topography, and to file the record of survey. It goes back to engineering, they cut the budget. Now your scope doesn't change, just your budget. That's how it starts. The project is rolling along, you're out of money, and you haven't filed a record of survey, or you haven't completed your field survey. You go to the engineering department and you tell them, we need to send a crew back out. 
and they say, you can't do it, we're out of money. You say, well, I need to file a record of survey to be in compliance with the law. And they'll say, well, you can do it on your own time if you want. Or they'll say, we'll get to that later. And later never comes. If your license is on that, it's your, it's your license, not theirs. The other thing that they tell you when they make you salary is that you're a professional, so you need to be salaried. And you may not check all the boxes to be legally exempt. What they do is, is they make you salary and they tell you things like, well, if you need a doctor's appointment or if you want to go golfing at, at some point in time, you can take that time off and it never shows up on your timesheet. You will work many, many years without ever seeing any of those days. They're very few and far between. What does success look like in this system? Well, here's how it works is the hours are constantly manipulated and the more you can manipulate the staff and your, your coworkers, then the more likely is you promote up. It's a system of manipulation. It's part of building trust and building loyalty and creating a company culture that we're hard workers and we're all in it together and there's this buy-in. The true success comes from the ability to manipulate time and that means manipulate people. And you build up this culture within that company. If you choose to live this life, that's, that's on you. But you must understand it's a one-way street. What happens is, is you give to the company, you play team ball, you're loyal and you're trustworthy. You're willing to make up the hours because you buy into the system. I've seen a lot of loyal people give a lot of loyal hours and get cut in the first round to become unemployed for an extended period of time. Now that we understand the model, let's talk about the solutions to the problems. Land surveying is the type of work that is really hard to gauge uh, a total cost. And so when you do a not to exceed contract, you become very vulnerable. And so these contracts should be set up with milestones or phases so that as you discover information and you are able to, to better round out your scope, then you can price the next phase. That shares the liability, the financial burden within the company and with the, with the client. And it's, it's really fair for both parties. The other thing you need to do as a land surveyor, if you're working for a public agency, you must demand qualification-based selection and not bid on low-bid projects and to create a ruckus if you see that. Land surveyors are a very specialized type of work, particularly the professional work that we do. It's much different than engineering. We're not easily commoditized. Where an engineer putting together a standard plan or a surveyor doing uh, curb staking, for instance, those are easy unit costs to figure out. But the professional work it's, it's quite different. The other solution is to have some honest talk. Let's throw away words like synergy and buy-in and these kind of things that really are tools to manipulate you to, to, into working hours that you're not paid. The billable hour and the utilization rates really became a thing in the 50s and into the 60s. And the business model changed within the law firms as it changed within the sales agencies. And instead of delivering quality or delivering value, it became a model of squeezing everything you can out of the employees and out of the client. And as a worst case scenario, you have what happened at Enron. Enron was an oil and gas company that made the papers in the early 2000s. And the head of Enron was a, a gentleman by the name of Jeffrey Skilling. And he had set up this system called a PRC, which was the Performance Review Committee. And they would bring in these Ivy League uh, people, hire them, and they would have this performance review committee evaluate them. And he would openly tell these people, a year from now, 20% of you will be gone. On the chart, you see employee distribution. And I think that you would find this in any firm. And what you see here is about 14% of the people are the high performers. Of course, there's a lower end to that. Then you have your average performers taking up about 68%. And then you have 14% on the bottom of this throw a percentage either way. Well, those 14%, that, that leaves 86% of the company, and these are scattered throughout. So when you look at Jeffrey Skilling's model, and they're cutting 20%, they're cutting that poor performance off the bottom and in, well into some of the average workers. How these young Turks made their money was in closing deals. 
So they would close deals, but once the deal was closed, they had made their money and they really weren't focused on the completion of the work or the completion of the project. This ultimately led to them cooking the books through very sophisticated schemes and it all came down. This started at the Performance Review Committee. I'd recommend reading about this. It's an interesting tale. If you want to read more about this, Google Frederick Winslow Taylor. He was the father of the billable hour. There's also a book, Beyond the Billable Hour, the law firms are moving away from the billable hour. It's getting too hard to retain the millennials. They aren't willing to work 220, 230 hours a month to have a one bedroom and eat top ramen. The millennials are known to quit a job at the drop of a hat. And I'm looking for them to break this system of manipulation.